Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 25 and reading through verse number 32. The King James text today reads, Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he, the elder son, was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, listen carefully to what I'm about to read, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Praise God. Amen. Bow your heads with me once again, Lord. The word of God is open. And with it also our hearts be open. Help us, Master, today, whatever struggles, whatever trials, whatever hardships we may have faced throughout the course of this week, let us now lay aside the spirit of heaviness and help us to put on the garment of praise. As the word of God goes forth, help us to be in a mindset of prayer. As we ought always be in a mindset of prayer. As the word of God is preached. And at every point where we are challenged. At every point where we might recognize we fall short. Or we are found lacking, let us under our breath pray and declare unto our God, Lord, help me, Jesus. Help me, Lord, in this area. Help me to do better, Lord, with this. Preaching is not a spectator sport. Preaching is offered as a means of helping the people of God to set goals to see where they ought to be to compare to hold up a mirror and to compare where we are compared with where we ought to be and Lord as the preacher preaches we ought to be constantly in communication with heaven desiring from you that you would assist us in living what we are hearing so that we might not leave the house of God merely having heard, but rather we might leave the house of God having heard, and in so hearing, having been transformed by the Word of God through the operation of the Holy Ghost. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I touch the speaker today. I need your touch, Lord. Help me to deliver this word with divine anointing that the hearer might receive. For we ask it in none other 
than Jesus. Wonderful, wonderful name. Praise God. Amen. I want to talk to us for a little while today. Now, this message may well go into two parts. I told you, I'm not certain if I'm going to be able to deliver it all in one fell swoop. We'll see. But I have an awful lot of scripture and a lot of notes, so I may have to break it in half and finish the remainder of the message next week. Many believers miss an important point in the story of the prodigal son. I'm asking the question today, what will you inherit? Many people miss a very integral point in this story of the prodigal son. While the wayward son eventually made his way back to the father's house where he could live once again a life of blessing and favor. Listen to me, children. He had already spent his inheritance. Many read the story of the prodigal son as though it is just an allegory. It is just a parable meant to illustrate the return of the backslidden son to his father's house. But there is something far deeper. Oh, I'm telling you, I love when the Holy Ghost gives me something deeper. Hallelujah. I love when God puts something in my spirit, reveals something to me that shows there's a whole lot more to this story than meets the eye. Oh, honey, this is about way more. It, oh, mm, mm. there is so much more to this story than just a backslider finding his way home. Oh, no, 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 no. You got to remember that backslidden son. Finally woke up. Finally realized, listen to me children, there's not a point I'm going to make in this message today that is not of great importance. So listen carefully. That boy finally realized. Oh, hallelujah. We love to use the word backslid. We love to talk of those who aren't living this thing the way they know they ought to be living it. Who aren't doing things the way they know they ought to be doing things. Who aren't being faithful to the Father's house. They're not being faithful to the Father's service. They're not being faithful to the Father's work. They're not contributing. Oh, listen to me. They're not contributing to their Father's wealth and success, which in turn translates into an increase in their inheritance. You think Donald Trump's kids work in his business and do the things within his business that they do because they give a flying fig about making their dad richer? No. There's not a one of them. I don't smell the stench of greed pouring off of them like a pig in a slop pen. No, they're doing what they're doing because they know that one day at some divinely appointed hour that old man is going to croak and when he does I'm going to get a piece of the pie so I work for daddy now so that later I'll have a bigger 
piece of the pie. Am I telling the truth? But see, that prodigal son decided, I don't want to work for daddy anymore. I want my share of my inheritance now to do with as I please. Got news for you, son. If daddy lives another 30 years, you're forfeiting an awful lot of inheritance. Kind of reminds me of the people who win the lottery, you know. And the lottery says, we can give you, you know, uh, $10,000 a month for the next 10, 20 years, whatever it is. And boy, the amount comes out to millions upon millions and millions. Or we can give you a cash payment of this amount, which is just a fraction of what the monthly payments would come out to be. And how many people opt for the one payment? Give it to me all now. Give me all of it now. But you're forfeiting a huge chunk of change. That's okay. I like the look of the nice shiny ball of cash in one lump sum payment. So give it to me. They don't stop to think for a moment they're going to have to pay taxes on that one lump sum. Whereas if they took it in payments, they'd probably be paying a lot lower rate of taxation because they'd be getting it in smaller pieces. Am I telling the truth? And over the course of time, they would have gleaned so much more, Tommy, than they ever got in that one lump sum payment. Oh, but their greed, their lust for sudden wealth, their desire to, but I want to be, if I get it in payments, I'm not going to be able to buy the car. I want the house. I want the boat. I want the furs. I want the jewels. I want the suits. I want the shoes. I want the diamonds. I want the land. I want. I'm not going to be able to buy everything all at once. And I want everything all at once. And I want it now. I don't want to have to wait. Listen to me, children. I told you there is not one point I want to make today that doesn't have great significance. I do not want to have to wait for some unspecified hour. No man knoweth the hour nor the day when the Son of Man shall return. Oh, hallelujah. I don't want to have to wait for an unspecified time to finally get what's coming to me. Folks, for the last almost 40 years, there's been a movement in the Christian community called the Prosperity Movement. The Prosperity Movement gospel. It is a lie. It is a perversion of the Christian faith. It is your road and your pathway to ruin because that message says to you, you can take your inheritance now. You can use it up in this world. Oh my God, have mercy. Why wait until some unspecified time to receive my full inheritance? No, I'd rather get what I can get now. I want God to bless me in this life. I want to be rich. I want to be a celebrity. I want to be successful. I want to be talented. I want to be prosperous. I want to wear the finest clothes, drive the finest cars, live at the finest address in the finest house, in the finest neighborhood of the finest city. I want my inheritance now!
And I'm going to tell you something. Oftentimes the Lord will say, Okay. The father didn't stop the son. He didn't tell the son, No, 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 son. No, you, you have to wait. You have to, I'm sorry, kid, but you're going to have to wait till I'm gone before you can get your inheritance. The father didn't do that, did he? No, he said, all right, son, here's your inheritance. Here's your blessing. Here's all that you want. Now you go ahead out in the world and spend it. I'm not going to remind you that when you finally grow tired and you've wasted because people without fail who are so hell-bent and so selfish and so greedy as to want everything in the here and now, those people without fail don't know how to manage what they get. And before too long, they find themselves broke and destitute and in a worse spot than they were before they received their partial inheritance. Am I telling the truth? Before they received their partial lottery winnings. Oh yeah, the prodigal son eventually woke up when he hit rock bottom. We all wake up when we hit rock bottom. <laughs> Foolish boy, he didn't wake up. Anywhere in the process, he had to wait until he got as low as he could get and things got as bad as they could get. Then all of a sudden he wakes up. And what does he realize? He realizes this, in my Father's house, oh hallelujah, there is a powerful point to be made here. We talk about people being backslid. You know why? Because we love to equate our conduct and our behavior with whether or not we're going to make heaven. We come, if you come from a fundamentalist or an evangelical background, you've grown up in a works based salvation message. And don't think for a minute you haven't, because you have. Somebody can believe this gospel. Somebody can obey. They can go down in the waters of baptism in the wonderful, glorious, saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. They can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives them the utterance. Oh, but let them fall out of church. Let them start acting the fool. Let them start doing things things ought not to be doing and all of a sudden every believer in the church has signed their soul off to a devil's hell only problem with that scenario is the Lord Jesus Christ said and lo I am with you always even to the end of the world. It doesn't matter where you drag him. It doesn't matter what whorehouse or what crack house or what porn theater you drag the Lord into. If you're his child, you're his child. That old prodigal had gotten to the bottom of the heap and all of a sudden something struck him. Something finally clicked in that little head of his. 
and he said, in my father's house, oh hallelujah, I may have taken my inheritance. I may have told daddy I wasn't going to work for him anymore. I wasn't interested in doing the work of the kingdom. I wasn't interested in going to church. I wasn't interested in reading my Bible and praying and worshiping and fellowshipping with the saints. I wasn't interested in doing things his way anymore. I wanted to do it my way. But you know what? From that conversation nothing has changed between his relationship with me. He's still my father. <laughs> In my father's house, even the people that serve are treated better and have a better quality of life than the mess I put myself in. But in our primary text today, we've gotten to the point where the prodigal son has made his way home and the father is looking for him to return. You see, there's something about age. I love these young people running around trying to bad talk this old preacher and trying to say all kind of things about this old preacher. I love it because I'm old enough, I've been around long enough to realize, honey, you can cut your nose off to spite your face. And all the while you think you're so slick and you think you're so smart and you think you've got it all figured out and you're really playing the fool. You know why? Because with age comes wisdom. With age comes experience. And I don't care how smart you think you are, 20-year-old. I don't care how smart you think you are, 30-year-old. I don't care how smart you think you are, 40-year-old. I was once you and thought I was as smart as you too. Now I'm 58 and I realize that up until yesterday I was a blubbering idiot. <laughs> Amen. Once you get to a certain age, folks, I'm going to tell you something. All of a sudden you realize, good grief, have mercy. It wasn't until yesterday I finally got my act together. It wasn't until yesterday I finally figured some important stuff out. It wasn't until yesterday I finally learned some lessons that I wish to God I had learned when I was young. But they were lessons that could only be taught by experience. And experience comes with time. And there is no substitute for time. You cannot accelerate learning. Daddy knew he'll be home. He'll be back. The son came home and the father was thrilled to see him. And he decided, let's have a party. Let's celebrate my youngest son's return home. And they begin to put together a great feast and a great celebration music and dancing lots of food now look at our story the older son where was he? he was in the field he was doing his father's work he was doing what dad asked him to do listen to me he was contributing to his future inheritance. Mm. Oh, the youngest comes home, 
Father, I'd be happy just to be your servant. And what did the father say? No, you left my son, you are my son. You left my son, you'll return my son. Hallelujah. I was out of church for a few years when I first came out thinking God hated me and God didn't want anything to do with me. And the Lord was mad at me and all this foolishness. And I want to tell you something. When I finally made my way home, glory to God, all I heard coming from death daddy's mouth was welcome home you left my kid and you've returned my kid hallelujah nothing has changed except for one rather important thing you've wasted your inheritance Well, but no, he's home now. That means he'll be restored. And that means that he'll get half of everything his son has. Oh, no, he won't. He already got his half. How do I know what I'm saying is true? Well, let's read in our primary text. In our primary text, beginning at verse 9, Luke 15, I'm sorry, no, 9, 29. The older son, and he, the older son, the answering, said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet over... And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. Look at the father's answer. I told you there's not a point I'm going to make that there is an important uh, information here. And he, the father, said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me. Oh, glory. S seven words. And all <laughs> that I have <laughs> is thine <laughs> oh hallelujah <laughs> oh I want to shout a while y'all just bear with me I want to get happy for a minute he said oh son thou art ever with me and all that I have is thine he didn't say and half of everything I've got will be yours hallelujah no sir the boy took his inheritance took it out into the world and spent it and he came home and he was restored as a son he can once again live in the father's house his father will once again feed him and clothe him but what will he inherit Nothing, because all, oh, <laughs> all that the Father has now belongs to who? The older son. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to tell you there is significance to this story that goes far beyond merely speaking of a backslidden child of God returning to the Lord. No, 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 no. No, this is not speaking of someone who's left the church and has lived rebelliously and lived worldly and lived carnally. And they finally come to their senses and come back to the church and come back to God. No, that's not the full significance of this story. No, in context, 
from a biblical perspective, we are reading an allegory, listen to me children, that asks the question, what will you inherit? When this thing is all over, when the last moment in time that counts down the clock of prophecy has taken place and the trump of God sounds and the voice of the archangel declares behold your king and Jesus Christ of Nazareth appears in the eastern skies to redeem his church what will you inherit listen to me today the father said to his oldest son all that I have is thine there was nothing left for the prodigal he had spent his inheritance like the lottery winner who prefers to get his cash all up front rather than paid out over time the prodigal would settle for less than he might have gotten had he waited and when he returned he returned to a home listen to me filled with love and comfort but the balance of all his father had belonged now to the eldest son oh hallelujah there will be many in heaven who will have lived their lives in such a way as to have laid up nothing toward eternity wishing instead to live in the temporal state of this present world a life of comfort and luxury the Lord may well have been speaking of these same two men this same father these same two sons these same three men I should say when he shared this parable in Matthew 21 28 through 31 but what think ye a certain man had two sons and he came to the first and said son go work today in my vineyard he answered and said I will not but afterward he repented and went and he came to the second and said likewise and he answered and said I go sir and went not whether of them which of them twain did the will of his father they say unto him the first Jesus saith unto them listen verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you Oh, I'm going to tell you, there's going to be a lot of people you're going to bump into on the golden streets of glory that you never expected to see there. Oh, preacher, are you going to say what you're thinking? Yeah, I'm going to say what I'm thinking. And they're going to walk that street of gold with you for a little while. And as they come up upon this glorious mansion on a hill they're going to look at you and say well brother excuse me it's been nice knowing you it's been wonderful catching up with you it's wonderful to talk about the goodness of God and the return of his Christ it's wonderful to know that you made it in but this is my new home so I'll have to leave you here 
then you walk into your mansion and that person who thought you'd never make it in never thought you'd ever be able to earn your way into heaven because their whole system was based on whether you could live up to some standard to satisfy God so that you might be saved. And as they walk into their mansion, guess where you're going to get to go? You're going to get to go find a nice shade tree by the river of life. So you can lay down and make yourself comfortable and enjoy the scenery. Oh, it's still going to be a glorious place. You're still going to be in God's heaven. You're still going to have inherited eternal life. Because eternal life is promised to all who believe and obey this gospel. But you've already spent your inheritance. There was nothing for you in God's heaven once you got there because you had laid up nothing in store to meet you when you arrived. Oh, you had it all here on earth. You were so proud of yourself. Why, you followed Kenneth Copeland to the ends of the earth, believing every word that lying devil spoke of a prosperity gospel, promising you that God would honor your greed and your avarice and your want and your lust for the things of this world. You thought you could have it all here and still have it all there. It doesn't work that way. This parable, Tommy, is about a whole lot more than a backslider coming back to church. No, 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 no. This parable is about eternity. This parable is literally bringing to mind the question, what will you inherit? Why did the story go past the son returning home and a party being thrown on his behalf? If all it is is a story about the backsliders coming home, why then did our primary text why did verses 25 through 32, why were they written? Why were they included in this story? There has to be some significance. It's not just a matter of, calm, believer, the backsliders come back to the Lord. Most people are happy to see the backslider come back to God. Most believers I know are thrilled to death to see someone who's left the church and who's been out of the way for a while. Most believers I know are thrilled to death to see the backslider come back to the Lord. It's a great source of joy for most in the church. And when a backslider comes back, they don't suddenly get, listen to me now, they don't suddenly get a party thrown for them. You don't see God lavishing upon the backslider all of a sudden all kinds of blessing and all kinds of favor and all kinds of uh, uh, special gifts, do you? No, backslider comes back to church. He comes back to the same church he left. He comes back on the same terms that he left on. Am I telling the truth today? No, the Lord is saying, in eternity, we're going to rejoice over everybody that makes it. We're going to rejoice over everybody 
that gets through the gate. Hallelujah. Everybody that passes through the gates of pearl, we're going to see a sea of believers, a sea of saints shouting and raising their hands and whistling and glorifying God for another soul that was saved, another soul that was redeemed, another soul that was preserved from the fires of destruction. But my friend, not every soul that enters into the kingdom of heaven will have the same reward. We've talked about that before. Our faith in God is demonstrated day by day as we live, listen to me, so as to invest in eternity. How is our faith in God displayed? By us praying publicly in a public restaurant over our meal? Is that how our faith is displayed? No. Because prayer is communication with God. It's not meant to be a show for the world to see. Jesus told us that. Am I telling the truth? But our faith is on display when we live our lives investing in eternity. Let me tell you something. Every time we come to the house of God, we're investing in eternity. Every time we pray a prayer, we're investing in eternity. Every time we give an offering, we are investing in eternity. Every time we pay our tithe, we are investing in eternity. Every time we witness to an unbeliever, we are investing in eternity. Every time we support the man of God, the woman of God, so they can go forth and do the evangelistic work that we ourselves are not able to do. We are investing in eternity. Every time we visit the sick, we are investing in eternity. Every time we go to a prison to see someone who has been incarcerated, to comfort them, to encourage them, we are investing in eternity. Every time we buy a meal for that homeless man who has nothing to eat, we are investing in eternity. Every time we go to the hospital to encourage and pray with someone who is sick or someone who is dying. We invest in eternity. We're doing the Father's work. We're abiding in His house. The word of the Lord said, Mine house shall be called. Mine house shall be called. A house of prayer. For all people. I'm going to tell you something children. When you think you can live for God. And you don't need the church to do it. And you don't think that there's a place. For organized religion. You're a dingbat. I don't know how else to say it. You're a dingbat. Because. While your thought process may sound right to you. It is unscriptural. It is not at all in keeping with the Father's blueprint. Coming together with the people of God. I don't care if you do it in somebody's living room. I don't care if you do it in a rented hall or in a meeting room at a hotel. Doesn't have to be a church house, no. Because the church is not the building. The church is the people. But when you think you don't need God's people to be part of God's church and you can do this thing without going to church and without paying tithes and without giving offerings and without supporting missions and you think you can go through your life without praying a prayer until you're desperate or cracking open your Bible until you can't find an answer anywhere else. got news for you you're wrong because the people who do these things 
are investing in eternity. When they get to glory, there's going to be something up there waiting on them. Oh, hallelujah. There's going to be a storehouse of treasures. There's going to be a storehouse of trophies waiting on them. And you will have nothing except eternal life. Because let me tell you something, God don't renege on His promise of eternal life. But He tells us plainly in the Word of God, who will inherit what? Say, really preacher? I don't have a whole lot more time before I'm going to have to split off and offer you the rest of this message next week. Our faith in God, I've said already, is demonstrated as we live our lives investing in eternity. Those who live with eternity ever before them will know riches and blessings and rewards in glory which those who have sought to live in pleasure and comfort here on earth will never know. Habakkuk 2 and 4, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Romans 1.17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Galatians 3.11 But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Hebrews 10.38 Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back my soul shall have no pleasure in him Matthew 6 19 through 21 the Lord Jesus Christ admonishes us with these words lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Our inheritance is dependent upon our faithfulness, to the will of God and the plan of God. When we try to force the Master's hand and seek to experience and own all that we can possess while sojourning in this temporal world, we forfeit the unimaginable blessings which are yet to come. 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18, the Apostle Peter wrote, For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it, be, if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Listen, and if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear Peter said the righteous are saved by the sheer grace of God he said but if the righteous barely make it in <laughs> said then what do you think is going to happen to the guy who's never believed and never obeyed this gospel so where shall the sinner and the ungodly stand listen to me children entrance into the kingdom of God 
and inheritance in the kingdom of God are not the same. The Lord has promised eternal life to all who will believe and obey His gospel. Oh, listen to me. I hope you're hearing me today. But entrance into the kingdom, eternal life, does not guarantee inheritance. The Word of God tells us concerning entering the kingdom of God. Matthew 19, 24, And again I say unto you, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Mark 9, 47, And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes. To be cast into hell fire. Mark 10, 15. Verily I say unto you. Whosoever shall not receive. The kingdom of God as a little child. He shall not enter therein. Mark 10, 23 and 24. And Jesus looked round about. And saith unto his disciples. How hardly shall they that have riches. Enter into the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. Mark 10, 25, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Luke 18, 17, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. Luke 18, 24, And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, speaking of the rich young ruler, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Verse 25, same chapter 18, Luke. For it is easier for a camel to go through the, and I, the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. John 3 and 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Acts 14, 22, Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is often referred to also as the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 23, 13. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 18, 3. And said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Lastly, Matthew 9, uh, 5 verse 20. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. We do not exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees through personal effort, but rather by embracing the righteousness of God, which is by faith. 
The mistake that the scribes and Pharisees made was in thinking that righteousness was attainable through human effort rather than by faith. But entering the kingdom, oh, I hope you hear me now because i got to stop here and finish next week. And I'm going to finish, I'm going to make sure you understand this point. Entering the kingdom and inheriting the kingdom are not the same. Prince Harry has all but been disowned by the royal family. Titles have been stripped from him. He doesn't have access to the royal houses and palaces. He's not given invitations to events that he normally would be invited to as a prince. He's still Prince Harry. He's going to die Prince Harry. His father is still King Charles. There is never going to be a day in the life of Prince Harry that King Charles is not his dad. Am I telling the truth? But he has no inheritance in the kingdom. He's in the family, but he has no inheritance in the kingdom. He's been stripped of that. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, I want to tell you, eternal life is promised to all those. If you look at that list I just read to you, every passage I read to you, every passage in the Word of God that speaks about entering into the kingdom of God, entering into the kingdom of heaven, we saw over and over again a few simple themes. One, you had to be born again. Born of the water, born of the Spirit. Two, you had to do things God's way. You don't get saved. You don't get converted. You don't wash your sins away and start afresh with God by praying the sinner's prayer. Nowhere in the Bible is there a sinner's prayer. Nowhere in the Bible are we told you pray a sinner's prayer and you become saved. The Lord said, you know how you get into the kingdom? He said, those that do the will of my Father. God has articulated what He desires that we do to be saved. And on the day of Pentecost, when they asked Peter, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter answered, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is unto you and to your children, to them that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. You may not like this good old-fashioned apostolic, biblical, Acts 2, 38 and 39, plan of salvation. But it's God's way. And there's no other way to get in but God's way. We're told over and over again, if we're going to get into the kingdom, we have to become as little children. Do you know what I did not read one time in the Lord's words about entering into the kingdom? I didn't read one time how you had to not commit this sin or not commit that sin or not do this act or not do that act. Oh my goodness. Jesus, Lord, you, you must not have been paying attention, Lord. You must not. Because the preachers in our world today tell us all about the things that will prevent us from getting in. In spite of our faith. Am I telling the truth? Jesus, you must have been distracted because you missed the point, Lord. All you talked about was doing the will of the Father. All you talked about was becoming as a little child. All you talked about was the 
difficulty in one who trusted in and lusted for riches entering into the kingdom. But you didn't say anything about the drunkard. You didn't say anything about the prostitute. You know, oh, wait a minute. Yes, you did. There was that time when you said they'll get into the kingdom before these will. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. We're going to finish this next week. Amen. I want us to